The first bad habit in R6 that I guarantee you have is you send your drone into the bomb site in the prep phase. You never want to be doing this. Instead, use your prep phase drone as a cutoff camera that you can use to drone yourself in during the action phase. There's many examples of this in every single map that you go to. If you go to Oregon, you have all of the drone holes that lead directly into sight, into the hallways, on the staircases. You have ones that you can get in tower, small tower, if you want to entry through there. You can put it in the room that you plan on rappelling into. It's the exact same thing. You don't want to send it to sight. And if you're good enough at the game, you can kind of hear what the guns are using and what utility that they're placing down, and you can hear their footsteps and already know what side and operators are playing. So there's no point at all that you should be sending in your drone just to die in the prep phase, just for a little bit of information that you could have gotten after the fact. Now, there are certain exceptions to this rule. If you're playing Yana, for example, she has an ability that is essentially a drone that she gets an infinite amount of times, which means you can afford to lose your drone or two, right? Same thing with Zero. Same thing with other informational operators like Dokubi or Jackal or if you're an entry fragger, you can afford to lose a drone, right? So any of those are certain exceptions, but just to build that good habit of not wasting your drone, I definitely recommend that you get a cutoff camera that you use to enter the building or for your teammates to use later into the round for an execute. Now that was just one out of 20 bad habits that you need to fix in Siege. The next of which being that you don't get on cameras after you die. I know that getting on cameras might seem boring, whether it's cameras on defense or even drones on attack, especially after you die, but staying on cameras is mind-numbing. I get it. However, if you aren't doing it, I can guarantee your teammates probably aren't doing it either. Let's be real, you're solo queuing, right? If you struggle with this, you can play defensive operators like Valkyrie and Maestro. These operators heavily incentivize you being on your cameras during and even after you're dead, so you can break this bad habit pretty easily. If you want to do this on attack, a great attacker you can do this with is Zero. Zero's primary function as an operator is a flank watch operator. You hide his cameras on the flank and you let your dead teammates watch them. Now, again, if you're in a solo queue environment, you can't really trust your dead teammates, right? So I would watch your cameras if everyone's alive because you know your teammates aren't going to, and even after they die, you might want to tell somebody, hey, watch this camera, or just watch it yourself, right? It might be a little bit boring, but at least you know that no one's going to flank you without you knowing about it. And if you have claymores, you can even double up on that fact as well. Now, if none of your teammates are dead, like I said, then you definitely need to be the one watching them. Because not only is it unlikely that they'll be doing it when they die, but it's heavily, heavily unlikely that they're going to do it if no one's dead at all, right? They're all busy doing their own thing. It's Siege, it is what it is. It might seem very boring and like a long-term fix, but I guarantee you doing this and playing like this is completely worth it. A bad habit that you can change immediately in Siege, though, is overcrouching. This is something that even I am guilty of to this day, so you might be wondering how this is such an easy change, yet I haven't even fully done it yet, which, understandable, but the answer is simply, if you want to do it for yourself, to unbind your crouch key. But first of all, why would you even want to stop crouching as a player in the first place? Why is this a mistake? If people are aiming head level, crouching might seem like a great idea to dodge people's bullets, but that's just the thing. The average player watching this video is around high silver to low gold. If I'm not right, let me know down in the comments and tell me what your rank is, but the majority of players in the game are, are silver and gold. Which means that more often than not, your enemies are not going to be aiming head level. They're aiming crouch level. So if you crouch, you will get headshotted more often than if you were just standing at the level they should be aiming at in the first place. Not only this, but crouching doesn't allow for fast movement, and it can make a lot of noise in the process. So if you want to silently sneak into a position, crouching can ruin that for you and make it to where you can't move away as fast. It can make it to where you can't quick peek as fast. Try quick peeking when you're crouched and try it while you're standing. It's not the same speed. If you want to run away, if you want to wide swing, doing it crouched is much, much slower. This brings me into unbinding your crouch key. Now, this does make it to where you can't crouch when you don't mean to, allowing you to stay standing and not crouch into an enemy headshot. Now, there are exceptions to this, like if you need to play a shield or sit behind an OSA shield, obviously you need to be able to crouch behind that so you don't get your head blown off. But you can always rebind it super quickly before the round if you see that you're going to play with an OSA or if you know you're going to need it for a certain piece of cover on the bomb site. But if you don't want to risk all of that for the sake of building this new skill, then you can literally just warm up with it. You do training grounds with it, you do your map tutorials with it, you do your shooting range, your arcade playlist, all without a crouch key, so that when you rebind it before your ranked games, you now are slowly building this habit of not over crouching and spamming your crouch key the second you get into a gunfight. Another skill you need to get down is not red pinging. There is zero reason at all ever in the entire game, literally ever, that you should red ping an enemy. Ever. There's no reason. 
All this does is alert the enemy that there's a camera watching them, and it gets your intel destroyed. Not only this, but if they know there's somebody watching them, they're going to play different. They're not going to hide and play as slow. They're going to be more aggressive because they're like, well, everyone's watching me. I might as well not try to hide and just go in, which can get you killed a lot of the times or get your teammates killed. Instead, just yellow ping. It's the exact same thing. You can even yellow ping with a callout or with comms in general, which will be just as accurate and even faster of information than a red ping that has a cooldown that you can only use every few seconds. Now that's a super easy mistake that you can fix. Something that can be a little bit harder for you to fix though as a player is repositioning after a gunfight, which I guarantee you you're not doing enough. This is one of the most important tips in the entire video, so listen up. A lot of players that I see, especially in lower elo, will take a gunfight with someone, win the gunfight, and just keep holding the angle they were just holding when they won the gunfight, expecting a second enemy to go there. If you killed someone, that person is just going to call up to their teammate, hey, he just killed me from 90 hall, and then you're just gonna get pre-fired or seal team 6 pinched by the entire enemy team. So do not do this. Not only this, but even if they don't have comms and you know the enemies are bad, they're not dumb, a lot of the times at least, I mean, I don't know. but you get the idea, they're not dumb, like, they're gonna see the bullets that you're shooting on the other side of the wall whenever you kill somebody, they're gonna see their teammate fall and blood splattered everywhere, so they're gonna know a rough area of where you're at, so just reposition. They'll call out where you were if you do reposition, and not only will that information be incorrect because you just left that place, but you can catch them by surprise from another different angle because they were expecting you to be somewhere else that they called out. This can go further than just the actual place you're standing though. If you get into a gunfight, instead of standing after you kill them, you can switch it up and crouch. That way, if the guy calls out, hey, he's standing right here, now you're gonna be crouched, they're gonna be aiming way above your head, and they're not gonna hit you, but you're still gonna hit them, right? The same thing even goes for quick peeking. If you quick peek, you're giving them the information when they saw you that you're standing, right? So then, when you re-peek to go for the kill, crouch, and now that information is invalid, and it's old, and it's outdated, so you're gonna get a lot of more kills just repositioning and re peeking in different ways and different positions than you were before. It might take time to get this down as it's very situational to the angles and the gunfights that you're taking, but after a bit you will eventually get it. A mistake you can fix in every situation you do it in is reloading too often. On March 7th, 2023, Operation Commanding Force came out, with the reload rework as one of its changes. This made it to where players could no longer reload cancel to magically just get that magazine back into their gun mid-animation to keep shooting somebody if they reloaded in a position that was bad. After the rework, what happens now is instead, one bullet is left in the gun if you try to cancel it mid-animation. It still gives you the option to hit the shot of the player that is coming at you if you're really, really good and it rewards good gunplay and realism, but it made it to where it's way more dangerous now to just casually reload in the middle of a gunfight, which is good. This update obviously is still in the game, so you only want to reload if you know for a fact that the enemy can't swing you when you do reload, whether that be because they're far away or because they're just in an awkward position to do it. Otherwise, if you don't have a choice and they are close enough to kill you, switch to your secondary weapon. Take the fight and find cover as fast as possible after doing this and after taking the gunfight with your secondary to reload your primary weapon. This leaves you less exposed and can be the difference between you winning or losing that gunfight. Something else that can make that same difference is the mistake of having a loser's mindset. Not the mindset of someone who is a loser, that's a bit mean, I'm not calling anybody a loser, but the loser mindset is the mindset of somebody who has just lost a few rounds, if that makes sense. No one likes losing, it sucks, and because of this and the ego that is tied around people's elo, not keeping your mental in check, especially after losing a few rounds, can make you make sloppier decisions, make careless plays, and take gunfights that someone who was winning wouldn't have taken. If you watch me live on twitch.tv slash alkafps, shameless plug, I definitely have my share of rage moments after losing a round or two. Trust me, it's a problem. I may over-exaggerate it for stream because it's funny, but like, it actually, like, my mental after losing a few rounds is a problem. I enjoy winning. It's very bad. It's an issue. But after the round is over and I'm done throwing my crybaby fit and it's on to the next round, most of the time at least, I turn over a new mental leaf and pretend the score isn't there and that I didn't just lose that round. Because we've all been there. Everybody has clutched a 0-3 lead score or they're losing down the 1-3 and they've clutched. If you can do it in the past, you can do it now. There's nothing stopping you. Because if trying last round didn't work, then not trying this round because you're tilted definitely isn't going to work either. 
Not only should you mentally turn over a new leaf like I said earlier, but you can take away every death or loss as a learning opportunity. If you died, it is 100% your fault, and you can always self-reflect to learn, which brings me into my 8th mistake of this video. Stop blaming your teammates. Now, like I said with the last tip, I definitely do this too. Like, I'm, I'm not past doing this. I'm human. We all do this, and I'm definitely, like, somebody who does this. But I try to moderate it as much as I possibly can. If you lose a gunfight 9 times out of 10, that is your fault somehow. There is something that you could have done to not lose that gunfight. Now, losing an entire game, yes, your teammates are also at fault there. Having two randoms with 0.3 KDs that are 1 and 8 each is not the best thing that could happen to you, right? Definitely their fault for sure. But in terms of actual round-to-round -round and gunfight-to-gunfight -gunfight losses, most of it is actually you, and you have the ability to affect whether you win these, which means if you lose, it is mainly on you. If he's 1 and 8, sure, that might suck, but that's not the reason you lost the gunfight. You are. Every time. Another reason you're losing gunfights is because you're making the mistake of not checking spawn peaks. If you're getting spawn peaked in the game unironically in year 9 of Rainbow Six Siege and you've been playing this game for longer than 3 years, that, that is never the enemy's fault, that is completely your fault. Every spawn peak in this game is completely avoidable if you check them and then go for the gunfight even if they're there. If you lose that gunfight, that's a completely different story and a different tip. But for the mistake, I'm purely talking about the way that people will just run out of spawn and then get spawn peaked and be surprised like, oh, I got spawn peaked. They're trying too hard. Like, no, you could have checked it and avoided that completely, completely on you. Every time you get spawn peaked from a new angle, you should make a mental note of where it was so that when you spawn in, you never die from that spawn peak ever again. I can say as a player who has been playing this game for years that I die to a spawn peak maybe two to three times every season that I didn't know about. And even then, I learned from that spawn peak and it rarely ever happens again. Because all of them are completely checkable with drones, quick peeking, information, sound calls in the prep phase, whatever it may be, which brings me into my next avoidable mistake. Stop over quick peeking. Now, I just said you need to do it more for spawn peaks, but now I'm saying you shouldn't do it as much, so what do I mean? This is what I mean. Quick peeking isn't meant as a mechanic you do before you get into a gunfight like most people think it is. Its conception was based on gathering information. That's what it was made to do. Let me explain this. If you have drones, you should literally never be quick peeking. If you have an information gadget that lets you get information on the room you're about to go into, there's no reason to ever quick peek in the game. The same thing goes for cams on defense. Quick peeking is a tool you use to clear angles in a room to see if anyone is in that room, so you can peek to see if anyone is there, but fastly unpeek before you get shot if they are there. Re-peeking to get that kill is different, but the actual act of quick peeking is meant to gather information on potential angles that defenders could be sitting in or attackers if you're on defense. Now, if you have drones or utility that could do this for you, why would you ever put yourself in the risk of getting pre-fired? You wouldn't. On attack, if you have a drone, just drone out all the angles. You don't want to put your head at risk when you're quick peeking of getting pre-fired. If you're on defense, you have cameras that you can use, sound calls that you can use, callouts that you can use to make it to where you don't need to quick peek and put yourself at risk. There's no reason. So stop quick peeking if you have drones or cameras that you can use and use those instead. Not only should you not be over peeking, but you also shouldn't be trying to passively attack. This game is fundamentally pretty simple. Attackers have to go to the defenders to either kill them or defuse a bomb within a given time. Keywords, within a given time. The actual attacking phase lasts around 3 minutes. One of those minutes usually is being spent on the attacking side entering the building and taking initial rooms and space so that you can get utility on the board and start droning and actually get the bomb down. If doing this takes any longer than one minute, this is bad. You should not be outside if a minute has gone by and you have two minutes left. You just shouldn't. And it's what I see a lot of low elo attackers fall victim to doing. The next two minutes of the round are attributed to using utility, like I said, to create an opening for the bomb plant, or finding an opening with a drone that you can abuse to get the bomb down or to get kills. If there's 30 seconds left and you haven't even made it to the site, you haven't even started using utility or getting kills, you're being way too slow. Attacking is called attack for a reason. You're literally attacking them. Stop being afraid of gunfights and letting that be the reason you don't get into the building and just grow a pair and go in. If you want to not be hard stuck, you have to do this. Another mistake that can keep you hard stuck is banning the wrong operators. I see way too many people banning operators like Cade, Mira, and Clash, when in reality on most maps there's way better operators you can ban. If you have a Thatcher, don't ban Cade. Thatcher counters Cade. 
Thatcher is a Cade counter. If you have him, don't ban Cade because you can just counter him and not waste a ban on Cade. Does that make sense? Obviously, it makes sense, but nobody ever thinks about that. I just thought I'd air that out a little bit. But there's other bans, too, that are kind of like that as well. Don't ban Mira on a map where Mira is barely used. Or, I mean, honestly, after this nerf at all. Stop banning Mira. Ash can counter her. Everybody plays Ash. Kali can counter her. Knifing can counter her. Playing Vert from above and below can counter her, right? So, like, use a bit of common sense. I know Mira was really, really powerful back in the day, so everyone has this bias that she's a super strong operator. She's not anymore. She really isn't. Stop banning her. Don't ban Jackal when, on certain maps, Dokubi does his job and brings more to the table. It just doesn't make sense. Actually think about your operator bans in a strategic way. For example, banning Azami on Coastline makes way more sense than banning Cade because Cade never gets used on Coastline. What wall are you going to keep closed? The quad wall upstairs? Who cares about that? Whereas Azami is used a lot on every bomb site, especially Hookah and Billiards. Osa, for an attacker example, is a great ban for Coastline instead of Thatcher when you never open a wall with Thatcher or Jackal for the exact same reason. Stop being a sheep and think a little bit harder about the actual bans that you're doing so that you can effectively ban defenders and attackers that are really going to mess up your hold or your push. Because if you're bad enough to auto-ban Jackal and Mira every single round, chances are, no matter who you ban, your enemies are too and they'll take care of it for you. Something else you need to stop doing is not communicating. Communicating is arguably the biggest advantage you can get as a Siege player other than like Zim on console, but you get the idea. Communication is very important in Siege. If you aren't giving callouts to your team, why aren't you? I'll wait. Right, that there's no good excuse, right? Okay. If you're shy, honestly, man, grow a pair. Like, if you don't have a mic, go buy one. You can get one for $10 at your local gas station. Like, you can afford it because you afforded the game and you afforded the console or even the PC that you play it on. So don't give me the excuse of, oh, I can't get a mic. I don't have... You can get one and use it. It's not hard. I can't even count the hundreds of times just one callout has saved me from winning the round or my teammates because I gave the callout for winning the round because it's just so common. But if you're not in as high of elo, it's less common that people use microphones, which is understandable. If your team isn't talking back, set the example. People are much more likely to be comfortable talking if you talk to them first, especially when it comes to in-game stuff when everybody wants to win and everybody wants to get that elo. Something actually more in-game related though is picking the wrong hard breacher. Now, this is something that I just dedicated an entire video to in my more recent videos that came out this week, but depending on the wall denial they have, you should be playing a different hard breacher. Stop insta-locking Ace every single round because he's the best hard breacher. He may be one of the best hard breachers for sure, but there's better scenarios where you could be using better hard breachers. For example, you don't want to use Ace if Hibana needs to get four hatches on the basement of Bank, right? Doesn't make sense. If they're running Bandit, play Ace, as Bandit can't get both walls electrified before at least one of them explodes, but Cade can get both at the same time. Now, if they're running Cade instead of playing Ace, use Thermite, as his explosion is faster, and paired with a Thatcher is impossible to Cade trick, whereas an Ace actually takes longer to explode both segments of the wall. If they have Turbo out, play Maverick, as Maverick can easily go through Turbo out walls and trick the wall. That was just three examples, but you get the idea by now. You should be tailor-making your hard breachers and honestly your entire attack to what the defenders are using. Now, speaking of utility mistakes, let's talk about my next mistake, which is not using secondary utility enough. Too often, especially in the lower elo, do I see people like Thermite dying with smoke grenades in their pocket. You should never do this. If you die as an operator, all of your utility should have been out on the board before you died. As Thermite, for a good example, you're a support operator. You use smoke grenades after you get a wall open to cut off angles so that you can go for a plant without them shooting you, right? If you open the wall and you're going for a plant and you die and you have two smoke grenades in pocket, it makes it almost impossible for your teammates to retake the diffuser and plant because they don't have the smokes that you had. Whereas if you had thrown the smokes down and you died, now the defenders don't have the angles so the attackers on your team have a better chance of getting that diffuser back and replanting. So you never ever want to be dying with secondary utility on the board ever. There's no excuse. Something else that you should never be doing is if you're playing an operator whose primary ability is a drone, like Brava, Flores, or Twitch, you should be droning in those drones every single time. There's no excuse why you shouldn't be doing this. What do I mean by this? Well, if you're playing Brava, let's say, you want to use a normal drone to drone in to make sure there's nobody just holding your drone hole so that your Brava drone can safely go in or so that you know not to drone there so that your Brava drone doesn't just get shot. The same thing can go for Twitch, Flores, or any other drone operator in the game. 
Another mistake that can greatly impact if you win or lose is not taking breaks. Now I get it, Siege is a frustrating game. It's honestly, word to my mother, one of the hardest games that you could possibly try to learn in the market right now. It's very, very hard to learn. And because of that, it is a very frustrating game to play. And you can get frustrated easily, not only because of how hard the game is, but because of the nature of the game being that it's a one-shot headshot game, there's a lot of bugs, it's old, there's cheaters. I get it. I play the game too, all right? It's frustrating. A mistake that you can make though is not just like taking a break once you lose. Because like I said, if you play tilted or if you play with a loser's mindset, you're going to go in and make a lot more mistakes than if you were with a better mindset, right? So what I'll do, if I get absolutely slammed in a ranked match or I'm really frustrated, I'll take the time, I'll get a water, I'll play an arcade between my next ranked match. That way I kind of like mentally reset myself. I've erased that from my mind and now I'm playing a ranked match. It's like a five minute break. Not only do you get the benefit of resetting your brain, but those guys you just went against, you don't have to go against them anymore because you Q dodged them effectively, right? Or if you have bad teammates, now because you Q dodged them because you played in an arcade, they're not going to be on your team anymore. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Something else that can really affect your mental if you keep doing it and losing because of it is just being on your phone. Get off your phone. If you're playing the game, you're playing the game to win, right? I, I mean, unless you're playing the game to have fun, then go play casual. That's not what we do over here at the Alka channel. We don't play for fun, baby. We play to win. Let's go. <laughs> no, but like on a serious note, though, like being on your phone, especially like in the prep phase, is never a good thing because you could be gathering information. Like I said in the first tip, you could be making cutoff cameras. You could always just be doing something rather than nothing to at least be a little bit more useful. Now, again, I do this shit. I'll be completely real. If I ever die, I'm doing my war attacks on Clash of Clans, right? But at least make it like moderate. If there's an opportunity where you're on defense and you can get on a camera and actually save your teammate's life, do that rather than complaining about a hog rider cycle that you're going against in Clash Royale, right? Like maybe, maybe step it up a bit, but you get the idea. Like just be on your phone as much as possibly. Wait, no, don't be on your phone <laughs> as much as you possibly can. The 19th mistake that I see players making is they're not adapting enough on attack. Now, just like you're not playing aggressive enough on attack, you need to be adapting by learning when to manage your aggression on attack. So adapting on attack is something you need to learn how to do. Not only this, but again, we're talking about operator selection. If you notice they have a Fenrir and you're playing Flores for an Azami, it would be a lot better if you played Brava to counter the Fenrir instead, right? So adapting your attack to what the defenders are doing. It's something that you need to be doing and it's crucial if you want to be winning. They added the repick phase for attackers for a reason. You want to be adapting. Not only this, but if you're doing like a push somewhere across the map, but you have four teammates with a Monty, Ying, and a Finca rushing the other side of the map, you going off and doing a backside take isn't going to do anything go rush with them you may not like it but them having that other extra person especially if they have bomb is going to make it way easier for you to win as opposed to you being on the opposite side of the map not helping them at all because it's better to adapt than it is to die the same exact thing can be said for defense where the mistake that i see is you're not giving up your defensive strat now on this channel we talk a lot about solo queue strats because it's strats that you can do by yourself that can actually have a lot of weight utility wise right but at a certain point if you're doing a solo queue roaming strat with let's say oryx but you have two teammates on site and it's a 3v5 maybe give up your strat and go back to site and help your team, right? You need to learn when to kind of like set your passion down for the game aside and just do what needs to be done to win. I see this a lot. If you have a castle strat that's extending somewhere, but they're, you're getting rushed on site, leave your castle strat. Who cares? Go make sure the bomb's not being planted. Go make sure your team's not going to lose the round, right? If you're roaming and you want to get an interrogation on Cav, but it's a 2v5 on site, get your ass off the roam. <laughs> get back to site. Please, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. That one player that I got onto yesterday on stream for playing, ca I'm talking to you. You made me very angry. <laughs> now, my final but definitely not least important mistake that you're making as a Rainbow Six Siege player is taking your top frags operators. If you notice that you have a teammate that is really 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 good at azami and is like going 12 and 1 on azami like just astronomical numbers stop taking azami don't take that from her obviously they have a good strat they have a good playstyle. they know how to use the gun they know how to use the utility don't take it from her not only is that rude it kind of just shows like hey fuck you i want this operator but also like you're, you're you're taking away a lot of your ability to win and your teammates ability to do what they want to do great example 
I'm really good at Monty and Boschi on Vigil. Those are two things that I can specialize in better than the average player. So if I'm doing good on Monty and I see my teammate take Monty, I'm gonna be like, well, there goes the round. <laughs> like, why did you do that? That doesn't make any sense. So just stop doing that. But with that out of the way, my name's Alka. Check out this next video and I hope we'll see you there. Later.